And I think the question you have to ask in ministry is, God, what more? Mm. God, is there something else that I haven't yet seen? Is there a larger vision? And when you have that mindset, ministry is always exciting because you're never locked in a box. It's always thrilling to see what more God wants to do. And welcome to another episode of the Pass the Baton podcast, where we are passing on what has been passed to us. And in this podcast, we talk about life, ministry, and everything in between. And in this episode, we are especially privileged to have a very special guest, Pastor Mark Finley. I know that he's pretty well known amongst the Adventist circles, but for those of you that are tuning into our podcast that are not very familiar with Pastor Mark Finley, uh, you know, we're, we'll just let him share a little bit about himself and his journey. Well, we've been ministry now 55 years. It's so amazing. You know, it goes by so quickly. But in my background, I was brought up in a wonderful home. Mother was a Catholic. Father was a Protestant. So there were different religions in the home. But never saw them argue once over religion. Later in life, my dad made a decision to follow Jesus more deeply, became a Seventh-day Adventist, influenced my life tremendously. And a wonderful father, very compassionate, understanding. In fact, um, he was very sensitive. I can remember times when my mother put certain foods on the table that he had chosen not to eat. He would pile up his plate with everything else and tell her what a wonderful meal it is. Mm. I remember when it was trout season and I wanted to go fishing and the dad would say to me, well, Mark, look, trout season starts on a Saturday, but you know, that's my day of church, Sabbath. Mm. Um, you go to early mass on Sunday and I'll take you fishing. I mean, you know, he, he just was so, my dad was so concerned about being with me, but yet I, I admired him because he had certain standards in his life and he opened the word of God to me and led me to Christ and led me to understand the Bible. And we went into ministry uh, and uh, pastored a number of churches and then went on to evangelism. And most of my life I've spent in evangelism, holding meetings around the world and traveling to different countries in the world and spent about 14 years at It Is Written Television. And then on to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists where I, I served in the world field. So just a, a brief little nutshell. Um, I just look back and just thank God for the opportunity, for the privilege of serving all these years. Well, since you've served in so many places and in so many different capacities through the ministry, um, obviously with that length of ministry, the core principles of scripture hasn't changed, but obviously technologies have changed, methodologies has changed. What has been the biggest um disturbance to ministry, maybe something that was, it was difficult for you to transition into as far as methods are concerned. Again, we, we understand that the scripture is the core, the teachings are the core, but what are some of the challenges that you ran into? And, and, how, and not only what challenges you ran into, how did you overcome those challenges? Early in my ministry, I would preach to smaller groups, obviously. And I thought if I had a couple hundred people, that would be a, a large group. Now, as I walk onto the platform, because of the advancement in technology, we can speak to tens of thousands of people. So I think one challenge for me was understanding more fully how to reach an audience that was not sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. But to recognize that we have an audience that of tens of thousands of people that are watching and the impact of the Spirit of God on their lives. So I think that was one big challenge, understanding that audience. We first began some of that in about 1995 when we did our satellite evangelistic meetings. And we had hundreds of churches throughout North America with thousands of people watching. And then onward after that, the um, Net 96, where we had like 1,800 churches. So that, so that was a challenge. I think there's a couple other challenges for me. 
One challenge is we live in a digital age mm -hmm. where everybody pretty much has their cell phone and um, the attention span of people is much less. So to be able to be faithful to scripture, to open the word of God, to proclaim the word, but yet reach a society that is media saturated. I think that's a, quite a challenge today mm -hmm. uh, in, in the society we face. Well, I just noticed that you opened up your Bible. It's it's that 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 Bible you hear about that tattered Bible where I, I see tape in the Bible. I see I don't know if there was a word on the page you opened up, which was in Revelation, that didn't have a note on it just then. So I think that's 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 fantastic. Um, John? Yeah, so one of the things that I've always admired about you, Pastor Mark, is that uh, you've been very consistent, but I've noticed over the years, I mean you obviously are well known for the net series and obviously preaching, but uh, I've also noticed that you've been able to pivot. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you had shared with us that uh, you started a YouTube channel. And, you know, that's kind of mind-blowing considering that sometimes, oftentimes rather, evangelists kind of get stuck in a certain mold to where they're consistently doing what they've always done, but they don't necessarily pivot with the time. So I was, I was wondering how, how you go about that process. Like, how do you analyze, you know, the current context of culture then pivot to try to reach that culture without sacrificing principles. The essence of ministry is not your methodology, mm -hmm. but the essence of ministry are the people to whom you are ministering. Mm -hmm. So the question you need to raise then in ministry is not preserving a method, but being effective. Mm -hmm. So the question I'm continually asking myself is, not how do you change the biblical message. As I have traveled from country to country, preaching in over a hundred countries now, I have seen the gospel and the message of the three angels and the prophetic message be cross-cultural. It, it touches people in villages in the Philippines. It touches people that are intellectuals uh, in university settings. I mean, I, I, I can remember a time when I was preaching in Moscow and um, I got invited to Pushina. Pushina was a city that was not on the Russian map. It was a closed city. It was a city of biological scientists where these scientists were studying chemical warfare. Mm. But after the fall of the former Soviet, and the Soviets, I mean, the, the average Russian population didn't even know what's on the map. And I remember being invited there to give three lectures. One is, what's the integrity of the Bible? Can you trust the Bible? The second was, who is Jesus? And the third, is there any evidence that the world's coming to an end and Christ can come? And I expected all these questions that would challenge me. We, I lectured for an hour and then had questions and answers from the scientists for an hour. And the amazing thing to me was the fact that their questions were about the basic issues of suffering and basic issues of how to get an answer to prayer. So the answer to your question very directly is this. The Bible speaks to men and women of every culture, but how we deliver that message can be different. So if you become too, if methodology becomes your sacred cow, then you, do, you don't broaden your base. So I'm constantly asking the question, is there any other way we can get the message of God out? That's what we go into YouTube ministry. <clears throat> because we see that that's where people are at. That's why we continue dabbling in television ministry, whether it's with Hope Channel, 3ABN. That's why we developed a radio program that we had for a few years. And now, in fact, we're taking our material and still putting it on radio. We're not on the major station we're on, but we have a number of radio networks that we're letting use out of. This is why we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on, we try to do everything we know to use every vehicle to get the message of God out. And I think the question you have to ask in ministry is, God, what more? Mm -hmm. God, is there something else that I haven't yet seen? Is there a larger vision? And when you have that mindset, ministry is always exciting because you're never locked in a box. It's always thrilling to see what more God wants to do. Wow. Now, this is, a, this is kind of a... I suppose an introspective question for you, not to say that all the questions we have already haven't been introspective, but you know, 
you've always had been many years in, in ministry, both in the uh, small pastoral setting and a major evangelist. If you were to give yourself, your young self, 50 years ago advice, now that you've gone through all of that, what are some things that you would tell your younger self 15 years ago? Sure. I think when you're early in ministry, one of the mistakes that many young pastors make is to be too success driven, mm. too results driven. So early in your ministry, do skill building. In other words, build the skill of being able to give a Bible study. Build the skill of um, preaching. Build the skill of a multifaceted ministry. So if early in your ministry, you are not concentrating on results and success as much as you are building those skills. As you build those skills, they will then translate into success. Mm. If you go after success without building the skills, you are going to ultimately not have success. Uh, that's one thing I think I would say. Early in your ministry, concentrate on building your skills. I know early in my ministry, I uh, really worked on preaching a great deal. And even today, it'll take me about 12 hours to write a new sermon. I write it out in manuscript form, type it on my computer, print it out, try to have the sermon written by Wednesday night or at latest Thursday noon. By Thursday night, I'm going over it. Friday, I'm going over it. So I go over the sermon three or four times before I preach it. And I, that skill was built early in my ministry when I was 21, 22 years old. Uh, I would, at those times, largely handwrite my sermons. I wasn't great at typing then. And I would go down in my basement of my home and just preach them and preach them and preach. So I think skill building is incredible, important. The second thing I think I would say to my younger self or any younger pastor is that we preach out of the overflow of who we are, that um, ministry becomes successful as we develop our devotional life. Yeah. And devotional life is extremely important to me. Um, a life in which you're not a phony. It's not make-believe. Um, you are what you are in the pulpit or in ministry because of what you are in your own devotional life. And even today, I have systematic devotional life. Like right now, I'm reading through Acts of the Apostles. The last week, I've read about 100 pages of Acts of the Apostles. I'm filling my mind with that. And I've read it before. This last year, I set a goal of reading the Conflict of the Ages series through and uh, read it through in six, seven months this last year. So I started reading it again. So that, I think, skill building, devotional life is critical. One other thing that I think is really important, and that is don't be afraid to do something new because you've never done it before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I remember, and I'll tell you a little funny story. I um, knew that one of the felt needs in the Boston area, we were living in South Lancaster, Massachusetts at the time, and I knew one of the felt needs in the Boston area was stress. And so I developed some material on stress management. I had never given a stress management workshop before. I was young at the time. And uh, we advertised for the stress management workshop. And when I got there, I got there a little late because I was late and I was under a little bit of stress. <laughs> so I go in, <laughs> so I, I go into lectures <laughs> on stress. And I see all of these business people, white shirts, you know, pinstripe shirts, you know, suits. Uh, attache cases coming into the stress management seminar. I mean, I'm like, you know, who am I, you know, in my late twenties, you know, is shaking like crazy to lecture on stress management to these executives. Jump into what you, just plunge into it. Don't worry about failure. Do the best, and God will teach you in that. Now, we were in Tanzania, Africa, two years ago, and I was asked to speak to government officials on stress management. So it was easy for me because I've been doing it for years. Um, so now I can get up and with 10 minutes preparation, lecture on stress management. Um, the same thing when my wife started cooking schools. We didn't know very much about that at all. She didn't know much. I didn't know much. But we jumped into it. So don't let your fear keep you from what God is calling you to do. When God gives you a vision for your ministry, don't let your fear keep you from doing that. So, so three things I tell a young preacher. 
First, build as many skills as you can when you're young. Put them in your toolbox. It's like a carpenter going to build a house. You gotta have a, you gotta have a hammer in that toolbox. You gotta have a saw. You gotta have nails. You gotta have so forth. So build a skill-filled toolbox of ministry options for you. Secondly, don't be afraid. Jump right in to things. Prepare well, but let God give you the vision. And thirdly, let your devotional life be the basis of everything you do. Well, that's that's really that's really powerful because I know I mean I've been a pastor now for about for about eleven years, mm-hmm. uh, full time, and about. 14 total. Mm-hmm. And if you count the time that I was, you know, did youth pastoring and uh, as uh, um, when I was in school, when I was, mm-hmm. when I was studying. And so I know that for me that, you know, the skill building actually was something that HMS Richard, another, yeah. another powerful preacher in the Adventist faith had talked about, you know, he said, focus on and specialize in something, be really good at something, focus on that one thing and develop that one. And then he talked about the devotional time of reading where, you know, he even sat there and said some of the things to read, you know, read through the entire Bible in January. They would yeah. read through the entire Bible in January, which is, that's a feat <laughs> to be able to do that. Yes. So it takes wow. anywhere about four to five hours a day of reading to be able to get through the entire, it's about 90 hours of reading right. Right. to read through the entire scripture and have a reading pace. So um, I really appreciate that. The next question I was going to ask you, and this is more for me, is like, so how do you, how do you focus on, you know, you're, you're so focused on ministry and reaching with people. How do you unwind? How do you relax? You know, um, how do you and your wife, you know, how do you strengthen that relationship, the personal relationships? Because I know for me, it's always, I get, the, I get the benefit because my wife is a teacher and so she works in ministry. And so I get to, we get to work a lot together and there's a lot of passion overlap, but how do you unwind? Because everybody sees the, the upfront preaching, how do you relax? What are some of the things you enjoy doing? A couple of things. I really appreciate what you said about you and your wife as partners in ministry. We have always seen ministry not as something I did, but something that we did. Mm-hmm. So Tini and I have always seen ministry as a joint ministry working together in ministry. And we've tried uh, in many instances to, in, to include our children in our ministry, our daughter, Rebecca, our son, Mark, and Debbie. Uh, so we have attempted... Uh, to include our, our family in ministry through the years in, in just a variety of ways. But um, how do we unwind? We walk a great deal. We love walking. Um, we rode bikes a lot more earlier in our lives. We still ride bikes. So Tini, of course, runs marathon, and I, rode, rode, and I, um, I ride a bike next to her and give her water as she is running. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so we do, we do, we do that. I'm the water person, the coconut water person, actually, in, in that process. Um, I enjoy hiking a great deal. We enjoy swimming a great deal. I have enjoyed playing golf, and so there are a variety of things that we like to do to unwind, uh, and I think that's really important. Okay. So what's your what's your handicap in golf? <laughs> right now I'm very handicapped because I hurt my back and haven't played in two years. Uh, so no, I would if if I were um, and I, I if I were playing golf uh, once a week I would be 12, 13 handicap. Okay, that's that's actually really impressive. That's that's a good score by the way, John. If you didn't know, um, that's uh, he averages just a few a few. Maybe, you're averaging par on at least, you know, a third of the course. Yeah, about a third I would, of the course yeah, I would be in, by scores, if the par is 72 on a course, I would be anywhere from 83 to 87. Okay. Typical. The best I think I got to was around, my 87, I think was my, 85 or 87 was one of my best games. No, that's great. around 92 was my average yeah. 72 on a course. Anyway, um, I enjoy that little, the little tidbits and stuff because yeah. we don't necessarily get that when, sure. when, you know, when we think about, when we think about those things. So, John, do you have any other, do you have any other questions? I, I do. Any way to start? Uh, I do. And, and, just, and I, you know, I think for, for many, for Tom, myself, and there are several pastors that do watch this podcast and many of us that are young in ministry are, are in very small districts, uh, out sometimes in the middle of nowhere, and we have a great deal of conflict yes. with our leadership because uh, these churches, unfortunately, if I'm just going to be frank and honest, are kind of like run by certain mm-hmm. personalities and families. And you know, when you come fresh out of seminary or undergrad, or you you come into pastoring from another field, you have so much 
energy and you want to preach the gospel, you want to do evangelism, you want to do everything that you shared, but, you know, church conflict inevitably gets, you know, you have to address it. And how do you, how do you navigate that? And especially in those moments where you feel like you're stuck and you feel like you're not progressing, you're just always kind of doing damage control because that's, that's the reality for a lot of us pastors. We want to do things. Well, how do you, how do you navigate that? I mean, have you, have you experienced that yourself and how do you, Get through that valley. My first district had three churches. The largest church was 28 members. Next one was 24. The next one met about 15 people, met in a cemetery chapel, and it was almost as dead as the cemetery. Oh, so <laughs> I, I, I can identify wow. very, very much with what you're saying. And there are, I think, there's no easy solution first, but there are some solutions. The first step I would take is building relationships with those people in the church that you believe can make a difference. So you ask yourself the question, I've got a 48 member church and 28 people are coming. Who in this church are the power brokers? Mm. Who in this church are the decision makers? Who in this church that if they really got on board, we could turn this church around? Invite them to your home to eat. Invite them over on a Friday night. Develop a relationship with them um, so that when you come to board meeting, because over a period of time, you went to visit them at their workplace, you prayed with them about their son who was sick, you prayed with them for their other daughter who was going through a divorce, you, you, you got your arms around them. They've developed a confidence base in you so that when you then come to the board meeting, you make a suggestion, they're going to see you with different eyes. If they see you as the new pastor who's come in that wants to make all the changes, they're going to resist. But if you are now their friend, so I think the first thing that I would say to a young pastor in a multi-church district is first develop your positive relationships with your key leaders. Secondly, I remember distinctly, I was in those days we had in-gathering and I was at an in-gathering banquet sitting next to a seasoned pastor. And I said to him, Pastor, I got three churches. I just don't know what to do. Can you help me? And he said, well, those three churches haven't grown in many years, have they? I said, no. He said, if you try to divide your time up, one third, one third, one third, they're not going to grow. He said, look at your church that has the greatest potential for growth and put 60% of your time in that. Mm. Then put 20% of your time in the other two churches. If during your tenure here, you can get that one church to grow from 25 to 50 to 60, then begin to work with your other churches. So I had to make some very hard decisions. And we began to concentrate on one particular church. That church began to grow, but we let the other churches know that we would be working with them effectively as well. So begin to ask yourself questions like this. Which church has the best physical facility and the greatest potential for growth? What church has members that want to grow? What church has a demographic in a city that is capable of growing? So if I have a nice physical plant, but it's way out in the country and it's a city of 800 people, but I've got another church that they kind of want to grow, and they're, but the facility isn't as good, but they're in a city of 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. I would more concentrate there. So I ask three questions. I say to myself, I am not capable of growing all three churches at once. I'm going to develop relationships with all three, but I'm going to look for a place where I have adequate demographic, where I have a city of that, that has reasonable opportunity to grow. I'm going to look at a where my best physical plant, and I'm going to try to see where my people really want to grow. And I'm going to begin concentrating on those. I want to and let the, and then the, another thing is developing what we would call a district mentality. And the mm. district mentality is that we're all in this together. Mm. That when we have the center church that's going to hold its evangelistic training and project, we're going to invite those other churches in. So we, and we have many district meetings because when you have a very small church, you may have three or four young people in that church that are teenagers, but you may have five in this church and four in that church. And you get them all together, you got 13 to 15 young people. 
But if you just did with one church, you may only have three. So the idea of a district meeting, bringing your people together, maybe once a quarter, and having major district celebrations, bringing somebody in from the conference office, that will help your churches a great deal. We actually, you know, we've done something similar to that. Uh, myself, John, uh, Daniel, who's behind the cameras now, uh, some of our other pastors have got together and created what we call um, uh, our Middle Kentucky Adventist Fellowship, which is about 18 churches or so. Um, and we kind of got together and decided to, um, when COVID broke out, that we were going to start doing something. So we started doing Facebook devotional every morning. We rotated through all six or seven of us pastors that were, that were doing at the time and started on Friday Night Vespers. Um, and then after about a year of doing this every Friday night and having several people come, we actually had a, um, a multi-district gathering we call a cornbread festival <laughs> where we did a cornbread and chili cook off and then got together and we had anywhere between 80 to 100 people that came to that from a bunch of churches and they've all built together. So I really appreciate you bringing that kind of something that we have tried doing. I guess the last question that we'll kind of close out with here is, you know, we've talked a lot about pastors and younger pastors and getting into ministry. What do you say to that church member who doesn't necessarily want to be a pastor, but they still have a passion for ministry? What advice would you give them on getting plugged in not only with the church, but how to find their specific niche or their niche in ministry? How could they discover their God giving talents? Because everyone's needing the church for it to flourish. How do they develop and find that one? And maybe even some of our listeners are in churches that the pastor isn't, they don't feel the pastor is very supportive or the leadership is very supportive of their vision of what ministry is. What advice would you give to that person? You know, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, there was some life going there. <laughs> uh, but yet that Lazarus was all bound up and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a philosophy as a pastor that I have for lay people. I want to loosen and let him go. Now, to be very, very specific to answer your question, the first thing as a pastor that I would ask that person is, what is God laying on your heart? What is God laying on your heart? So somebody says, look, God is laying on my heart to do literature ministry. I say, let's sit down and look at all the possibilities of literature ministry for you. Here are the different possibilities. Somebody says, God is laying on my heart, health ministry. Let's sit down together and look at that. Let me get you plugged in with our health ministry leader. Let me get you plugged in with our literature ministry leader. Somebody says, well, we don't have a literature ministry leader in our church. All right. When nominating committee comes around, here's, I appreciate you telling me that, John. When nominating committee comes around, if I present your name, would you be interested in being the health, the literature ministry leader? So I want to find out first what God has put on the heart of that person. Then I want to help to resource them in that area. And then thirdly, I want to monitor what they're doing and have them come back to me in the process of that. Uh, If we already have a ministry like that in the church and we get them plugged into that ministry, but particularly in small churches, you often don't have that ministry. Um, I want to also be sensitive to conference training events. So let's suppose here's an elder that I think has some potential in preaching. And um, there's a, a seminar for preaching that the local conference has. I want to get be able to resource that elder, get him there. So what is the burden that person has? How can I get him plugged into something that's already going on? How can I resource that person? And then how can I help him with follow-up to grow? Mm-hmm. John? I mean, there's so many other things I'm going to ask, but, you know, our time is coming up. Um, Usually before we close, we like to highlight um, specific ministries or some things that you're really passionate about. So for those uh, of our podcast uh, followers or viewers on YouTube, uh, what are some things that you are a part of that you just want to highlight ministry-wise that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Let me share a number of them. If you don't have our YouTube channel and you want inspirational sermons and uh, questions and answers, Hope Lives 365. Hope Lives 365. Or you can just go Mark Finley YouTube. But if you go on Hope Lives 365, you are going to find our uh, YouTube channel. If you go on Hope Lives 365, BibleStudies.com, you'll come to our 
Hope Lives 365 University. We have a Bible study university. So Hope Lives 365 Bible studies.com, Bible study.com. We have about 176 courses in the university now, courses on Bible studies, prophecy, health, preaching, leadership, etc. You'd be really blessed with them. Most of them are free. So those two things. Um, the other thing is we have a wonderful pastor's retreat center. If you're a pastor, you have a group of pastors that want to come up to be trained for, we usually start on a Sunday and on a Thursday noon. If you want to be trained and also get some relaxation, come up to our retreat center and I'm going to give you a phone number that you can call 301-680-6619. And you can talk to Sonia Howard for our retreat center. So we'd love to have you come down to the retreat center, usually from Sunday to Thursday, and the meals are great. We have wonderful fellowship, great Bible study, 301-680-6619. Well, thank you, Pastor Mark, for joining us. We'd love to have you another episode if we could ever schedule a time, but uh, we always close our podcast with a prayer, so could you share it for, for us? Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can share together just open, relaxed way with our younger pastor friends. I just pray a blessing upon them, draw each one of them closer to you. Out of the overflow of their experience, may they share your word with their communities. May they see these smaller churches grow and enlarge. May they be powerful agents of Christ. Be with each one that's watched this podcast today. I pray that you touch their lives. Give them inspiration, encouragement, and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.